Chapter 11 of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 11 Good heavens, mother! They're married! cried Zora, staring at a telegram she had just received. Mrs. Oldreeve woke with a start from her after luncheon nap. Who, dear? Why, Emmy and Septimus Dix! Read it! Mrs. Oldrey put on her glasses with faltering fingers, and read aloud the words as if they had been in a foreign language. Septimus and I were married this morning at the Chelsea Registrar's. We start for Paris by the two-thirty. We'll let you know our plans. Love to mother from us both. Emmy. What does this mean, dear? It means, my dear mother, that they're married, said Zora. But why they should have thought it necessary to run away to do it in this hole-and-corner fashion, I can't imagine. "'It's very terrible,' said Mrs. Oldreeve. "'It's worse than terrible, it's idiotic,' said Zora. She was mystified, and being a woman who hated mystification, was angry. Her mother began to cry. It was a disgraceful thing. Before a registrar, too. "'As soon as I let her go on the stage, I knew something dreadful would happen to her,' she wailed. "'Of course, Mr. Dix is foolish and eccentric, but I never thought he could do anything so irregular.' "'I have no patience with him,' cried Zora. "'I told him only a short while ago that both of us would be delighted if he married Emmy.' "'They must come back, dear, and be married properly. Do make them,' urged Mrs. Oldreeve. "'The vicar will be so shocked and hurt, and, and what Cousin Jane will say when she hears of it.' She raised her mittened hands and let them fall into her lap. The awfulness of Cousin Jane's indignation transcended the poor lady's powers of description. Zora dismissed the vicar and Cousin Jane as persons of no account. The silly pair were legally married, and she would see that there was a proper notice put in the Times. As for bringing them back, she looked at the clock. They're on their way now to Folkestone. It wouldn't be any good telegraphing them to come back and be properly married in church. Not the slightest, said Zora, but I'll do it if you like. So the telegram was dispatched to Septimus Dix, the loin boat, Folkestone. Mrs. Oldreeve took a brighter view of the situation. "'We have done what we can, at any rate,' she said, by way of self-consolation. Now it so happened that Emmy, like many another person at their wit's end, had given herself an amazing amount of unnecessary trouble. Her flight had not been noticed till the maid had entered her room at half-past eight. She had obviously packed up some things in a handbag. Obviously, again, she had caught the 8.15 train from Ripstead, as she had done once or twice before when rehearsals or other theatrical business had required an early arrival in London. Septimus's telegram had not only allayed no apprehension, but had aroused a mild curiosity. Septimus was master of his own actions. His going up to London was no one's concern. If he was starting for the equator, a telegram would have been a courtesy. But why announce his arrival in London? Why couple it with Emmy's? And why, in the name of guns and musical comedies, should Zora worry? But when she reflected that Septimus did nothing according to the orthodox ways of men, she attributed the superfluous message to his general infirmity of character, smiled indulgently, and dismissed the matter from her mind. Mrs. Oldreeve had nothing to dismiss, as she had been led to believe that Emmy had gone up to London by the morning train. She only bewailed the flighty inconsequence of modern young women, until she reflected that Emmy's father had gone and come with disconcerting unexpectedness from the day of their wedding to that of his death on the horns of a buffalo, whereupon she fatalistically attributed her daughter's ways to heredity. So while the two incapables were sedulously covering up their tracks, the most placid indifference as to their whereabouts reigned in Nunsmere. The telegram, therefore, announcing their marriage, found Zora entirely unprepared for the news it contained. What a pitiful tragedy lay behind the words she was a million miles from suspecting. She walked with her head above such clouds, her eyes on the stars, taking little heed of the happenings around her feet, and, if the truth is to be known, finding mighty little instruction or entertainment in the firmament. The elopement, for it was nothing more, brought her eyes, however, earthwards. Why? she asked not realising it to be the most futile of questions when applied to human actions. To every such why 
there are a myriad answers. When a mysterious murder is committed, everyone seeks the motive. Unless circumstance unquestionably provides the key of the enigma, who can tell? It may be revenge for the foulest of wrongs. It may be that the assassin objected to the wart on the other man's nose. And there are men to whom a wart is a pelion of rank offence, and who believe themselves heaven-appointed to cut it off. It may be for worldly gain. It may be merely for amusement. There is nothing so outrageous, so grotesque, which, if the human brain has conceived it, the human hand has not done. Many a man has taken a cab, on a sudden shower, merely to avoid the trouble of unrolling his umbrella, and the sanest of women has been known to cheat a bus conductor of a penny, so as to wallow in the gratification of a crossing sweeper's blessing. When the philosopher asks the everlasting why, he knows, if he be a sound philosopher, and a sound philosopher is he who is not led into the grievous error of taking his philosophy seriously, that the question is but the starting point of the entertaining game of speculation. To this effect spake the literary man from London when next he met Zora. Nansmere was in a swarm of excitement, and the alien bee had, perforce, to buzz with the rest. "'The interesting thing is,' said he, "'that the thing has happened, "'that while the inhabitants of this smug village "'kept one dull eye on the decalogue "'and another on their neighbours, "'romance on its rosy pinions was hovering over it. Two people have gone the right old way of man and maid. "'They have defied the paralysing conventions of the engagement. "'Oh, the unutterable, the humiliating, deadening period!' When each young person has to pass the inspection of the other's relations, when simpering friends maddeningly leave them alone in drawing-rooms and conservatories so that they can hold each other's hands, when they are on probation, coram publico, our friends have defied all this. They have defied the orange blossoms, the rice, the wedding presents, the unpleasant public affidavits, the whole indecent paraphernalia of an orthodox wedding, the bridal veil, Survival from the barbaric days when a woman was bought and paid for, and a man didn't know what he had got until he had married her and taken her home. The senseless new clothes which brand them immodestly wherever they go. Two people have had the courage to avoid all this, to treat marriage as if it really concerns themselves, and not Tom, Dick, and Harry. They've done it. Why, why doesn't matter. All honour to them. He waved his stick in the air. They had met on the common and the lame donkey, who had strayed companionably near them, took to his heels in fright. "'Even the donkey,' said Zora, "'Mr. Dix's most intimate friend, doesn't agree with you.' "'The ass will agree with the sage only in the millennium,' said Rattenden. But Zora was not satisfied with the professional philosopher's presentation of the affair. She sought Wiggleswick, whom she found before a blazing fire in the sitting-room, his feet on the mantelpiece, smoking a Havana cigar. On her approach he wriggled to attention, and, extinguishing the cigar by means of saliva and a horny thumb and forefinger, put the stump into his pocket. "'Good morning, Wigglesbeck,' said Zora cheerfully. "'Good morning, ma'am,' said Wigglesbeck. "'You seem to be having a good time.' Wigglesbeck gave her to understand that, thanks to his master's angelic disposition and his own worthiness, he always had a good time. "'Now that he's married, there will have to be a few changes in household arrangements,' said Zora. "'What changes?' "'There will be a cook and parlour-maid and regular hours, and a mistress to look after things.' Wigglesweek put his cunning grey head on one side. "'I'm sure they'll make me very comfortable, ma'am. If they do the work, I won't raise no manner of objection.' Zora, regarding the egoist with mingled admiration and vexedness, could only say, "'Oh!' "'I never raised no objection to his marriage from the first, said Biggleswick. "'Did he consult you about it?' "'Of course he did,' he replied with an indulgent smile, "'while the light of sportive fancy gleamed behind his blear eyes. "'He looks on me as a father, he does, ma'am. "'Wigglesweek,' says he, "'I'm going to be married.' "'I'm delighted to hear it, sir,' says I. "'A man needs a woman's hand about him,' says I. "'When did he tell you this?' Wigglesweek searched his inventive memory. "'About a fortnight ago. "'If I may be so bold, sir, who is the young lady?' I asked. "'It's Miss Emily Aldreeve,' says he. "'And I said, 
a nicer, brighter, prettier bit of goods. Oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. Young lady, you couldn't pick up between the ear and hound's ditch. I did say that, ma'am. I'll tell you straight. He looked at her keenly to see whether his expression of loyal admiration of his new mistress had taken effect, and then continued. And then he says to me, Wigglesweek, there ain't going to be no grand wedding. You know me. And I does, ma'am. The outlandish things he does, ma'am, would shock an alligator. I should forget the day, says he. I should lose the ring. I should marry the wrong party. I should forget to kiss the bridesmaids. Lord knows what I shouldn't do. Says we're going up to London to be married on the QT. And don't you say nothing to nobody. So you've been in this conspiracy for a fortnight, said Zora severely, and you never thought it your duty to stop him doing so foolish a thing? As getting married, ma'am? No, such a silly thing as running away. Of course I did, ma'am, said Wigglesbrick, who went on mendaciously to explain that he had used every means in his power to prevail on his master to submit to the orthodox ceremony for the sake of the family. Then you might have given me a hint as to what was going on, Wigglesworth assumed a shocked expression. "'And disobey my master? Orders is orders, ma'am. I once wore the Queen's uniform.' Zora, sitting on the arm of a chair, half steadying herself with her umbrella, regarded the old man standing respectfully at attention before her, with a smile whose quizzicality she could not restrain. The old villain drew himself up in a dignified way. "'I don't mean the government uniform, ma'am.' I've had my misfortunes like anyone else. I was once in the army, in the band. Mr. Dix told me that you'd been in the band, said Zora, with all her graciousness, so as to atone for the smile. You played that instrument in the corner. I did, ma'am, said Wigglesweek. Zora looked down at the point of her umbrella on the floor. Having no reason to disbelieve Wigglesweek's circumstantial, though entirely fictitious, story, and having by the smile put herself at a disadvantage, she felt uncomfortably routed. "'Your master never told you where he was going, or how long he was likely to be away?' she asked. "'My master, ma'am,' replied Wigglesbrick, "'never knows where he's going. That's why he wants a wife who can tell him.' Sora rose and looked around her. Then, with a sweep of her umbrella indicating the general dustiness and untidiness of the room, "'The best thing you can do,' said she, "'is to have the house thoroughly cleaned and put in order. "'They may be back any day. "'I'll send in a charwoman to help you.' "'Thank you, ma'am,' said Wigglesworth, somewhat glumly. "'Although he had lied volubly to her for his own ends, "'he stood in awe of her commanding personality "'and never dreamed of disregarding her high behests. "'But he had a moral disapproval of work. "'He could see no nobility in it, having done so much in forced labour in his time. "'Do you think we need begin now, ma'am?' he asked anxiously. "'At once,' said Zora. "'It will take you a month to clean the place, and it will give you something to do.' She went away, femininely consoled by her exercise of authority, a minor victory covering a retreat. But she still felt very angry with Septimus. When Clem Cipher came down to Penton Court for the weekend, he treated the matter lightly. "'He knew that he was acceptable to your mother and yourself, so he has done nothing dishonourable. All he wanted was your sister and the absence of fuss. I think it's sporting of him. I do, truly.' "'And I think you're detestable,' cried Zora. "'There's not a single man that can understand.' "'What do you want me to understand?' "'I don't know,' said Zora, "'but you ought to understand it.' A day or two later, meeting Rattenden again, she found that he comprehended her too fully. "'What would have pleased you,' said he, "'would have been to play the Sir Nobler, "'to have gathered the young couple in your embrace, "'and magnanimously given them to each other, "'and smiled on the happiness of which you had been the bounteous dispenser. "'They've cheated you. "'They've cut your part clean out of the comedy, and you don't like it. "'If I'm not right, would you kindly order me out of the room? "'Well?' he asked, after a pause during which she hung her head. "'Oh, you can stay,' she said with a half-laugh. "'You're the kind of man that always bets on a certainty.' Rattenden was right. She was jealous of Emmy for having unceremoniously stolen her slave from her service. That Emmy had planned the whole conspiracy, she had not the slightest doubt. 
and she was angry with Septimus for having been weak enough to lend himself to such duplicity. Even when he wrote her a dutiful letter from Paris, to the telegram he merely replied, "'Sorry, impossible.' Full of everything save Emmy and their plans for the future, she did not forgive him. How dared he consider himself fit to travel by himself? His own servant qualified his doings as outlandish. "'They'll make a terrible mess of their honeymoon,' she said to Clem Cipher. "'They'll start for Rome and find themselves in St. Petersburg.' "'They'll be just as happy,' said Cipher. "'If I was on my honeymoon, do you think I'd care where I went?' "'Well, I wash my hands of them,' said Zora with a sigh, as if bereft of dear responsibilities. "'No doubt they're happy in their own way.' And that, for a long time, was the end of the matter. The house, cleaned and polished, glittered like the instrument-room of a man of war, and no master or mistress came to bestow on Wigglesworth's toil the meed of their approbation. The old man settled down again to well-earned repose, and the house grew dusty and dingy again, and dustier and dingier as the weeks went on. It has been before stated that things happened slowly in Nunsmere, even the reawakening of Zora's nostalgia for the great world and life and the secrets of the earth. But things do happen there eventually, and the time came when Zora found herself once again too big for the little house. She missed Emmy's periodical visits. She missed the regulation of Septimus. She missed her little motor expeditions with Cypher, who had sold his car and was about to sell the car-house, Kilburn Priory. The cure seemed to have transformed itself from his heart to his nerves. He talked of it, or so it appeared to her, with more braggadocio than enthusiasm. He could converse of little else. It was going to smash Jabuza Jones's cuticle remedy to the shreds of its ointment boxes. The deepening vertical line between the man's brows she did not notice, nor did she interpret the wistful look in his eyes when he claimed her help. She was tired of the cure, and the remedy, and Cypher's fantastic need of her as an ally. She wanted life, real, quivering, human life. It was certainly not to be found in Nunsmere, where faded lives were laid away in lavender. For sheer sensations, she began to tolerate the cynical analysis of the literary man from London. She must go forth on her journeyings again. She had already toyed with the idea when, with Septimus's aid, she had mapped out voyages round the world, now she must follow it in strenuous earnest. The calendars had cabled her an invitation to come at once to Los Angeles. She cabled back an acceptance. "'So you're going away from me,' said Cypher, when she announced her departure. There was a hint of reproach in his voice, which she resented. "'You told me in Monte Carlo that I ought to have a mission in life. I can't find it here, so I'm going to seek one in California.' What happens in this sleepy hollow of a place that a live woman can concern herself with? There's Cypher's cure. My dear Mr. Cypher, she laughed protestingly. Oh, said he, you're hoping it on more than you imagine. I'm going through a rough time, but with you behind me, as I told you before, I know I shall win. If I turn my head round and I'm sitting at my desk, I have a kind of fleeting vision of you hovering over my chair. It puts heart and soul into me and gives me courage to make desperate ventures. As I'm only there in the spirit, it doesn't matter whether the bodily eye is in Nunsmere or Los Angeles. How can I tell? said he, with one of his swift, clear glances. I meet you in the body every week and carry back your spirit with me. Zora Middlemist, he added abruptly after a pause, I implore you not to leave me. He leaned his arm on the mantelpiece from which Septimus had knocked the little china dog, and looked down earnestly at her as she sat on the chintz-covered sofa behind the tea-table. At her back was the long casement window, and the last gleams of the wintry sun caught her hair. To the man's visionary fancy they formed an aureole. "'Don't go, Zora!' She was silent for a long, long time, as if held by the spell of the man's pleading. Her face softened adorably, and a tenderness came to the eyes which he could not see. A mysterious power seemed to be lifting her towards him. It was a new sensation, pleasurable, like floating down a stream with the water murmuring in her ears. 
Then suddenly, as if startled to vivid consciousness out of a dream, she awakened, furiously indignant. "'Why shouldn't I go? Tell me once and for all. Why?' She expected what any woman alive might have expected, save the chosen few who have the great gift of reading the souls of the poet and the visionary. And Clem Cipher, in his way, was both. She braced her nerves to hear the expected. But the poet and the visionary spoke. It was the old story of the cure, his divine mission to spread the healing unguent over the suffering earth. Voices had come to him as they had come to the girl at Dombrainy, and they had told him that through Zora Middlemist and no other was his life's mission to be accomplished. To her, it was anticlimax. Reaction forced a laugh against her will. She leaned back among the sofa cushions. Is that all? she said, and Cypher did not catch the significance of her words. You seem to forget that the role of mascot is not a particularly active one. It's all very well for you, but I have to sit at home and twirl my thumbs. Have you ever tried that by way of soul-satisfying occupation? Don't you think you're just a bit egotistical? He relaxed the tension of his attitude with a sigh, thrust his hands into his pockets, and sat down. I suppose I am. When a man wants something with all the strength of his being, and thinks of nothing else day or night, he develops a colossal selfishness. It's a form of madness, I suppose. There was a man called Bernard Palissy who had it, and made everybody sacrifice themselves to his idea. I've no right to ask you to sacrifice yourself to mine. You have the right of friendship, said Zora, to claim my interest in your hopes and fears, and that I've given you and shall always give you. But beyond that, as you say, you have no right. He rose with a laugh. I know. It's as logical as a proposition of Euclid. But all the same, I feel I have a higher right beyond any logic. There are all kinds of phenomena in life which have nothing whatsoever to do with reason. You have convinced my reason that I'm an egotistical dreamer. But nothing you can do or say will ever remove the craving for you that I have here and he thumped his big chest, like hunger. When he had gone, Zora thought over the scene with more disturbance of mind than she appreciated. She laughed to herself at Cypher's fantastic claim. To give up the great things of the world, life itself, for the sake of a quack ointment, it was preposterous. Cypher was as crazy as Septimus, perhaps crazier, for the latter did not thump his chest and inform her that this gun or his patent convertible bed-razor strop had need of her here. Decidedly, the results of her first excursion to the big world had not turned out satisfactorily. Her delicate nose sniffed at them in disdain. The sniff, however, was disappointingly unconvincing. The voices of contemptible people could not sound in a woman's ears like the drowsy murmuring of waters. The insane little devil that had visited her in Clem Cipher's garden whispered her to stay. But had not Zora, in the magnificence of her strong womanhood, in the hunger of her great soul, to find somewhere in the world a mission in life, a fullness of existence which would accomplish her destiny? Down with the insane little devil and all his potential works! Zora laughed and recovered her serenity. Cousin Jane, who had had much to write concerning the elopement, was summoned, and Zora, with infinite baggage in the care of Turner, set sail for California. The new world lay before her with its chances of real, quivering human life. Nunsmere, where nothing ever happened, lay behind her. She smiled graciously at Cypher, who saw her off at Waterloo, and said nice things to him about the cure. But before her eyes danced a mirage in which Clem Cipher and his cure were not visible. The train steamed out of the station. Cipher stood on the edge of the platform and watched the end of buffers until they were out of sight. Then he turned and strode away, and his face was that of a man stricken with great loneliness. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twelve. 
It never occurred to Septimus that he had done a quixotic thing in marrying Emmy, any more than to pat himself on the back for a monstrously clever fellow when he had completed a new invention. At the door of the registry office he took off his hat, held out his hand, and said good-bye. "'But where are you going?' Emmy asked in dismay. Septimus didn't know. He waved his hand vaguely over London and said, "'Anywhere.' Emmy began to cry. She had passed most of the morning in tears. She felt doubly guilty now that she had accepted the sacrifice of his life. An awful sense of loneliness also overwhelmed her. "'I didn't know that you hated me like that,' she said. "'Good heavens!' he cried in horror. "'I don't hate you. I only thought you had no further use for me. "'And I am to be left alone in the street?' "'I'll drive you anywhere you like,' said he. "'And then get rid of me as soon as possible. "'Oh, I know what you must be feeling.' Septimus put his hand under her arm and led her away in great distress. "'I thought you wouldn't be able to bear the sight of me.' "'Oh, don't be silly,' said Emmy. Her adjuration was on a higher plane of sentiment than expression. It comforted Septimus. "'What would you like me to do?' "'Anything except leave me to myself.' "'at any rate for the present. "'Don't you see I've only you in the world to look to?' "'God bless my soul,' said he. "'I suppose that's so. "'It's very alarming. "'No one has ever looked to me in all my life. "'I'd wander barefoot for you all over the earth. "'But couldn't you find somebody else "'who's more used to looking after people? "'It's for your own sake entirely,' "'he hastened to assure her. "'I know,' she said. "'But you see it's impossible for me to go to any of my friends, "'especially after what has happened.' "'She held out her ungloved left hand. "'How could I explain?' "'You must never explain,' he agreed sagely. "'It would undo everything. "'I suppose things are easy after all when you've set your mind on them, "'or get some chap that knows everything to tell you how to do them. "'And there's lots of fellows about that know everything, "'solicitors and so forth. "'There's a man who told me about a registrar.' See how easy it was. Where would you like to go? Anywhere out of England, she shuddered. Take me to Paris first. We can go on from there anywhere we like. Certainly, said Septimus, and he hailed a hansom. Thus it fell out that the strangely married pair kept together during the long months that followed. Emmy's flat in London had been rented, furnished. The maid Edith had vanished, after the manner of many of her kind, into ancillary space. The theatre and all it signified to Emmy became a past dream. Her inner world was tragical enough, poor child. Her outer world was Septimus. In Paris, as she shrank from meeting possible acquaintances, he found her a furnished appartement in the boulevard Raspey, while he perched in a little hotel close by. The finding of the appartement was an illustration of his newly invented optimistic theory of getting things done. He came back to the hotel where he had provisionally lodged her, and informed her of his discovery. She naturally asked him how he had found it. "'A soldier told me,' he said. "'A soldier? Yes, he had great baggy red trousers and a sash around his waist and a short blue jacket braided with red, and a fez with a tassel and a shaven head. He saved me from being run over by a cab.' Amy shivered. "'Oh, don't talk of it in that calm way. Suppose you've been killed.' "'I suppose the Zouave would have buried me. He's such a helpful creature, you know. He's been in Algiers. He says I ought to go there. His name is Hegisipi Crucio.' "'But what about the flat?' asked Emmy. "'Oh, you see, I fell down in front of the cab, and he dragged me away and brushed me down with a waiter's napkin. There was a cafe within a yard or two. And then I asked him to have a drink, and gave him a cigarette.' He drank absinthe without water, and then I began to explain to him an idea for an invention which occurred to me to prevent people from being run over by cabs, and he was quite interested. I'll show you. You won't, said Emmy with a laugh. She had her lighter moments. You'll do no such thing, not until you've told me about the flat. Oh, the flat, said Septimus in a disappointed tone, as if it were a secondary matter altogether. I gave him another absinthe, and we became so friendly that I told him that I wanted a flat, and didn't in the least know how to set about finding one. It turned out that there was an appartement vacant in the house of which his mother is concierge. He took me along to see it, and introduced me to Madame, his mother. He's also got an aunt who can cook. "'I should like to have seen you talking to the Zouave,' said Emmy. "'It would have made a pretty picture, 
the two of you hobnobbing over a little marble table? It was iron, painted yellow, said Septimus. It wasn't a resplendent café. I wonder what he thought of you. Well, he introduced me to his mother, replied Septimus gravely, whereat Emmy broke into merry laughter for the first time for many days. I've taken the apartment for a month, and the aunt who can cook, he remarked. What? cried Emmy, who had not paid very serious regard to the narrative. Without knowing anything at all about it? She put on her hat, and insisted on driving there incontinently full of misgivings, but she found a well-appointed house, a deep-bosomed, broad-beamed concierge, who looks as if she might be the mother of twenty helpful zouaves, and an equally matronly and kindly-faced sister, a Madame Bolivard, the aunt aforesaid who could cook. Thus, as the ravens fed Elijah, so did zouaves and other casual fowl aid Septimus on his way. Madame Bolivard, in particular, took them both under her ample wing, to the girl's unspeakable comfort. A brave femme, Madame Bolivard, who not only could cook, but could darn stockings and mend linen, which Emmy's frivolous fingers had never learned to accomplish. She could also prescribe miraculous tisane for trivial ailments, could tell the cards, and could converse volubly on any subject under heaven. The less she knew about it, the more she had to say, which was a great gift. It spared the girl many desolate and despairing hours. It was a lonely, monotonous life. Septimus she saw daily. Now and then, if Septimus were known to be upstairs, Higisipe Crusoe, coming to pay his filial respects to his mother and his mother's bouillabaisse, she was from Marseille, and her matelot of eels, luxuries which his halfpenny a day could not provide, would mount to inquire dutifully after his arm, and incidentally after the belle dame du troisième. He was their only visitor from the outside world, and as he found a welcome and an ambrosial form of alcohol compounded of Scotch whisky and maraschino, whose subtlety Emmy had learned from an eminent London actor-manager at a faraway supper-party, he came as often as his respectful ideas of propriety allowed. They were quaint gatherings, these, in the stiffly furnished little salon. Emmy, fluffy-haired, seashell-cheeked, and softly raimented, lying indolently on the sofa amid a pile of cushions, she had sent Septimus out to La Salle Méditerraine to buy some, in French, furnished rooms they stuffed the cushions with cement, and he had brought back a dozen in a cab, so that the whole room heaved and swelled with them. Septimus, with his mild blue eyes and upstanding hair, looking like the conventional picture of one who sees a ghost. Higisipi Crusoe, the outrageousness of whose piratical kit contrasted with his suavity of manner, sitting with military precision on a straight-packed chair, and Madame Bolivard standing in a far corner of the room, her bare arms crossed above her blue apron, and watching the scene with an air of kindly proprietorship. They spoke in French, for only one word of English had Hekisipi and his aunt between them, and that being how to do Godam was the exclusive possession of the former. Amy gave utterance now and then to peculiar vocables which she had learnt at school, and which Hekisipi declared to be the purest Parisian he had ever heard an Englishwoman use, while Septimus spoke very fair French indeed. Higisipi would twirl his little brown moustache. He was all brown, skin and eyes and close-cropped hair, and even the skull under the hair, and tell of his military service and that of the beautiful sunshine of Algiers, and when his aunt was out of the room, of his Arcadian love affairs. She served in a wine-shop in the Rue des francs Boucher. When was he going to get married? At Emmy's question he laughed, with a wave of his cigarette, and a clank of his bayonet against the leg of the chair. On a sou a day? Time enough for that when he had made his fortune. His mother then would doubtless find him a suitable wife, with a diary. When his military service was over, he was going to be a waiter. When he volunteered this bit of information, Emmy gave a cry of surprise. This dashing, swaggering desperado of a fellow, a waiter? I shall never understand this country, she cried. "'When one has good introductions and knows how to comport oneself, one makes much.' And he rubbed his thumb and fingers together, according to the national code of pantomime. And then his hosts would tell him about England and the fogs, wherein he was greatly interested. Or Septimus would discourse to him of inventions, the weak spot in which his shrewd intelligence generally managed to strike. And then Septimus would run his fingers through his hair and say, "'God bless my soul, I never thought of that.' 
and Emmy would laugh. Or else they talked politics. Hegesipe, being a radical, fichet himself absolutely of the Pope and the priests. To be kind to one's neighbours and act as a good citizen summed up his ethical code. He was as moral as any devout Catholic. "'What about the girl in the Rue des Francs-Bouchers?' asked Emmy. "'If I were a good Catholic, I would have two, for then I could get absolution,' he cried gaily, and laughed immoderately at his jest. The days of his visits were marked red in Emmy's calendar. "'I wish I were a funny beggar, and had lots of conversation like our friend Crusoe, and could make you laugh,' said Septimus one day, when the tedium vitae lay heavily on her. "'If you had a sense of humour, you wouldn't be here,' she replied with some bitterness. Septimus rubbed his thin hands together thoughtfully. "'I don't know why you should say that,' said he. "'I never heard a joke I didn't see the point of. I'm rather good at it.' "'If you don't see the point of this joke, I can't explain it, my dear. It has a point the size of a pyramid.' He nodded and looked dreamily out of the window at the opposite houses. Sometimes her sharp sayings hurt him. But he understood all in his dim way, and pardoned all. He never allowed her to see him wince. He stood so long silent that Emmy looked up anxiously at his face, dreading the effect of her words. His hand hung by his side. He was near the sofa where she lay. She took it gently in a revulsion of feeling, kissed it, and as he turned, flung it from her. "'Go, my dear. I'm not fit to talk to you. Yes, go. You ought to be here. You ought to be in England, in your comfortable home, with Wigglesbrick and your books and inventions. You're too good for me, and I'm hateful. I know it, and it drives me mad.' He took her hand in his turn, and held it for a second or two in both of his, and patted it kindly. "'I'll go out and buy something,' he said. When he returned, she was penitent and glad to see him, and although he brought her as a present a hat, a thing of purple feathers and green velvet and roses, in which no self-respecting woman would be seen mummified a thousand years hence, she neither laughed at it nor upbraided him, but tried the horror on before the glass, and smiled sweetly while the cold shivers ran down her back. "'I don't want you to say funny things, Septimus,' she said, reverting to the starting point of the scene, "'so long as you bring me presents such as this.' "'It's a nice hat,' he admitted modestly. The woman in the shop said that very few people could wear it. "'I'm so glad you think I'm an exceptional woman,' she said. "'It's the first compliment you have ever paid me.' She shed tears, though, over the feathers of the hat before she went to bed. Good tears, such as being great comfort and cleanse the heart. She slept happier that night, and afterwards, whenever the devils entered her soul and the pains of hell got hold upon her, she recalled the tears and they became the holy water of an exorcism. Septimus, unconscious of this landmark in their curious wedded life, passed tranquil though muddled days in his room at the Hotel Gaudet. A gleam of sunlight on the glazed hat of an omnibus driver, the stick of the whip and the horse's ear, as he was coming home one day on the Imperial, put him on the track of a new sighting of apparatus for a field gun which he had half invented some years before. The working out of this, and the superintendence of the making of the model at some works near Vincennes, occupy much of his time and thought. In matters appertaining to his passion, he had practical notions of procedure. He would be at a loss to know where to buy a toothbrush, and be dependent on the ministrations of a postman or an old woman in a charcoal shop. But to the place where delicate instruments could be made, he went straight, as instinctively and surely as a buffalo heads for water. Many of his books and papers had been sent him from time to time by Wigglesbrick, who began to, to dread the post, the labour of searching and packing and dispatching, becoming too severe a tax on the old villain's leisure. These lay in promiscuous heaps about the floor of his bedroom, stepping-stones amid a river of minor objects such as collars and bits of India rubber, and the day before yesterday's petit journal. The femme de chambre and the dirty, indeterminate man in a green baize apron who went about raising casual dust with a great feather broom, at first stowed the letter away daily, with jackdaw ingenuity of concealment, until Septimus gave them five francs each to desist, whereupon they desisted with alacrity, and the books became the stepping-stones aforesaid, stepping-stones to higher things. His only concern was the impossibility of repacking them when the time should come for him to leave the Hotel Godet, 
and sometimes the more academic speculation as to what Zora would say should some miracle of levitation transport her to the untidy chamber. He could see her, radiant and commanding, dispelling chaos with the sweep of her parasol. There were a few moments in the day when he did not crave her presence. It had been warmth and sunshine and colour to him for so long that now the sun seemed to have disappeared from the sky, leaving the earth a chill monochrome. Life was very difficult without her. She had even withdrawn from him the love, in a sort of way, to which she had confessed. The goddess was angry at the slight cast on her by his secret marriage. And she was in California, a myriad of miles away. She could not have been more remote had she been in Saturn. When Emmy asked him whether he did not long for Wiggleswick and the studious calm of Nunsmere, he said, No. And he spoke truly, for wherein lay the advantage of one spot on the earth's surface over another, if Zora were not the light thereof? But he kept his reason in his heart. They rarely spoke of Zora. Of the things that concerned Emmy herself so deeply, they never spoke at all. Of her hopes and fears for the future, he knew nothing. For all that was said between them, Morden Prince might have been the figure of a dream that had vanished into the impenetrable mists of dreamland. To the girl he was a ghastly memory which she strove to hide in the depths of her soul. Septimus saw that she suffered, and went many quaint and irrelevant ways to alleviate her misery. Sometimes they got on her nerves. More often they made the good tears come. Once she was reading a tattered volume of George Eliot, which she had picked up during a stroll on the quays, and calling him over to her side, pointed out a sentence. Dogs are the best friends. They are always ready with their sympathy, and they ask no questions. That's like you, she said. But George Eliot had never met a man like you, poor thing, so she had to, to stick the real thing down to dogs. Septimus reddened. Dogs bark and keep one from sleeping, he said. My next-door neighbour at the Hotel Godet has two. An ugly man with a beard comes and takes them out in a motor-car. Do you know I'm thinking of growing a beard? I wonder how I should look in it. Emmy laughed and caught his sleeve. Why won't you even let me tell you what I think of you? Wait till I've grown my beard, and then you can, said Septimus. That will be never, she retorted, for if you grow a beard you'll look a horror, like a prehistoric man, and I shan't have anything to do with you so I'll never be able to tell you.' "'It would be better so,' said he. They made many plans for settling down in some part of rural France, or Switzerland. They had the map of Europe to choose from. But Septimus's vagueness and a disinclination for further adventure on the part of Emmy kept them in Paris. The winter brightened into spring, and Paris, gay in lilac and sunshine, held them in her charm. There were days when they almost forgot, and became the light-hearted companions of the lame donkey on Nunsmere Common. A day on the same, for instance, in a steamboat, when the water was miraculously turned to sparkling wine, and the great masses of buildings were bathed in amber, and the domes of the Pantheon, and the Envalide, and the Cartouche, and bosses of the Pont and Alexandre Troyes shone burnished gold. There was Autouy, with its little open-air restaurants, rustic trellis and creepers, and its friture of gudgeon and dusty salt and cutlery and great yards of bread, which Emmy loved to break with Septimus like Christmas crackers. Then afterwards there was the winding Seine again, Robinson Crusoe's island in all its greenery, and saint Cloud with its terrace looking over the valley to Paris, wrapped in an amethyst haze, with here and there a triumphant point of glory. A day also in the woods of Bas Medon, alone beneath the trees, when they talked like children, and laughed over the luncheon basket which Madame Bonivard had stuffed full of electrifying edibles, when they lay on their backs and looked dreamily at the sky through the leaves, and listened to the chirrup of insects awakening from winter, and the strange cracklings and tiny voices of springtide, and gave themselves up to the general vibration of life which accompanies the working of the sap in the trees. Days, too, in mid-Paris, in the Luxembourg gardens, among the nursery maids and working folk, at cafés on the remoter boulevard, where the kind of life of Paris, still untouched by touristdom, passes up and down, and the spring gets into the step of youth and sparkles in a girl's eyes. 
at the window even of the appartement in the boulevard Raspail, when the air was startlingly clear and scented, and brought the message of spring from far lands, from the golden shores of the Mediterranean, from the windy mountain tops of Auvergne, from the broad, tender green fields of central France, from every heart and tree and flower, from Paris itself quivering with life. At such times they would not talk, both interpreting the message in their own ways, yet both drawn together into a common mood in which they vaguely felt that the earth was still a land of romance, that the mystery of rebirth was repeating itself according to unchanging and perpetual law, that inconsiderable, forlorn human atoms though they were, the law would inevitably affect them too, and cause new hopes, new desires, and new happiness to bud and flourish in their hearts. During these spring days, there began to dawn in the girl's soul a knowledge of the deeper meaning of things. When she first met Septimus and delightfully regarded him as a new toy, she was the fluffy, frivolous little animal of excellent breeding and half-education, so common in English country residential towns, with the little refinements somewhat coarsened, the little animalism somewhat developed, the little brain somewhat sharpened by her career on the musical comedy stage. Now, there were signs of change. A glimmering notion of the duty of sacrifice entered her head. She carried it out by appearing one day, when Septimus was taking her for a drive, in the monstrous nightmare of a hat. It is not given to breathing male to appreciate the effort it cost her. She said nothing, neither did he. She sat for two hours in the Victoria, enduring the tortures of the uglified, watching him out of the tail of her eye, and waiting for a sign of recognition. At last she could endure it no longer. "'I put this thing on to please you,' she said. "'What thing? The hat you gave me.' "'Oh, is that it?' he murmured in his absent way. "'I'm so glad you like it.' He had never noticed it. He had scarcely recognised it. It had given him no pleasure. She had made of herself a sight for gods and men to no earthly purpose. All her sacrifice had been in vain.' It was then that she really experienced the disciplinary irony of existence. She never wore the hat again, wherein she was blameless. The spring deepened into summer, and they stayed on in the boulevard Raspail until they gave up making plans. Paris baked in the sun, and theatres perished, and riders disappeared from the acacias, and cooks' brakes replaced the flashing carriages in the Grand Avenue des Champs-Élysées and the great Anglo-Saxon language resound from the Place de la Bastille to the Bon Marché. The cab-horses drooped as if drugged by the vapour of the melting asphalt beneath their noses. Men and women sat by doorways, in front of little shops, on the benches in wide thoroughfares. The Latin quarter blazed in silence, and the gates of the great schools were shut. The merchants of lemonade wheeled their tin vessels through the streets, and the bottles crowned with lemons looked pleasant to hot eyes. For the dust lay thick upon the leaves of trees and the lips of men, and the air was heavy with the over-fulfilment of spring's promise. Septimus was sitting with Hegesipe Crucio outside the little café of the iron tables painted yellow, where first they had consorted. "'Mon ami,' said he, "'you are one of the phenomena that makes me believe in the bon Dieu. "'If you hadn't dragged me from under the wheels of the cab,' I should have been killed, and if I had been killed, you wouldn't have introduced me to your aunt who can cook, and what I should have done without your aunt, heaven only knows. I owe you much. Bah, mon vieux, said Hegesipe, what are you talking about? You owe me nothing. I owe you three lives, said Septimus. End of chapter 12《ハッピーナイトクラブ》Chapter 13 of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox Hegesippi Crucio laughed and twirled his little brown moustache. If you think so much of it, said he, you can acquit your debt in full by offering me another absent to drink the health of the three. Why, of course, said Septimus. Hegesippi, who was sitting next to the door, twisted his head round and shouted his order to those within. It was a very modest little café. In fact, it was not a café at all, but a marchand des vins with a zinc counter inside, 
and a couple of iron tables outside on the pavement to convey the air of a terrasse. Septimus, with his genius for the inharmonious, drank tea, not as the elegant nowadays drink at Colombins or Rumpelmeyer's, but a dirty grey liquid served with rum, according to the old French fashion, before Fivotlucca became a verb in the language. When people ask for tea at a marchand des vins, the teapot has to be hunted up from goodness knows where, and as for the tea. Septimus, however, sipped the decoction of the dust of ages with his usual placidity. He poured himself out a second cup, and was emptying into it the remainder of the carafe of rum, so as to be ready for the toast as soon as Hegisipi had prepared his absinthe, when a familiar voice behind him caused him to start and drop the carafe itself into the teacup. "'Well, I'm blessed,' said the voice. It was Clem Cipher, large, commanding, pink, and smiling. The sight of Septimus hobnobbing with the zouave outside a humble wine-merchant's had drawn from him the exclamation of surprise. Septimus jumped to his feet. "'My dear fellow, how glad I am to see you! Won't you sit down and join us? Have a drink!' Cipher took off his grey Homburg hat for a moment, and wiped a damp forehead. "'Phew! How anybody can stay in Paris this weather, unless they are obliged to, is a mystery!' "'Why do you stay?' asked Septimus. "'I'm not staying. I'm passing through on my way to Switzerland to look after the cure there. But I thought I'd look you up. I was on my way to you.' I was in Nunsmere last week, and took Wiggleswick by the throat and choked your address out of him. The Hotel Godet. Somewhere about here, isn't it?' "'Over there,' said Septimus, with a wave of the hand. He brought a chair from the other table. "'Do sit down.' Cypher obeyed. "'How's the wife?' "'The what?' asked Septimus. "'The wife, Mrs. Dix.' "'Oh, very well, thank you,' he said hurriedly. "'Let me introduce you to my good friend Monsieur Egisipi Crucho of the Zouave.' Monsieur Crucho, Monsieur Clem Cipher. Egisipe saluted and declared his enchantment according to the manners of his country. Cipher raised his hat politely. Of Cipher's cure, friend of humanity. Don't forget that, he said laughingly in French. Kesika, kesikasa, asked Hegisipe, turning to Septimus. Septimus explained. Aha! cried Hegisipe, open mouthed, the light of recognition in his eyes. La cure si faire! He made it rhyme with prayer. "'But I know that well, and it is monsieur who fabricates sa machine la. "'Yes, the friend of humanity. What have you used it for?' "'For my heels when they had blisters after a long day's march.' The effect of these words on Cypher was electrical. He brought both hands down on the table, leaned back in his chair, and looked at Septimus. "'Good heavens!' he cried, changing colour. "'It never occurred to me.' "'What?' Why, blistered heels, marching! Don't you see? It will cure the sore feet of the armies of the world. It's a revelation. It will be in the knapsack of every soldier who goes to manoeuvres or to war. It will be a jolly sight more useful than a marshal's baton. It will bring soothing comfort to millions of brave men. Why did I never think of it? I must go round to all the war offices of the civilised globe. It's colossal. It makes your brain reel. Friend of humanity, I shall be the benefactor of the human race. "'What would you have to drink?' asked Septimus. "'Anything. Donnez-moi un boc,' he said impatiently, obsessed by his new idea. Uh, "'Tell me, Monsieur Crucho, you who have used the Curcifer, it is well known in the French army, is it not? You had it served out from the regimental medical stores?' "'Ah, no, monsieur, it is my mother who rubbed it on my heels.' Cypher's face expressed a disappointment, but he cheered up again immediately. "'Never mind. It is the idea that you have given me.' "'I'm very grateful to you, Monsieur Crucho.' Hegisipi laughed. "'It is to my mother you should be grateful, Monsieur. "'I should like to present her with a free order for the cure for life, "'if I knew where she lived.' "'Oh, that is easy,' said Hegisipi, "'seeing that she is concierge in the house "'where the belle dame of Monsieur has her appartement.' "'Her appartement?' Cypher turned sharply to Septimus. "'What's that? I thought you lived at the Hotel Godet.' "'Of course,' said Septimus, feeling very uncomfortable. "'I live in the hotel, and Emmy lives in a flat. "'She couldn't very well stay in the Hotel Godet, "'because it, it, it isn't a nice place for ladies. "'There's a dog in the courtyard that howls. "'I tried to throw him some cold ham the other morning, "'about six o'clock, to stop him, "'but it hit a sort of dustman who ate it and looked up for more. "'It was very good ham, and I was going to have it for supper.' 
"'But, my dear man,' said Cypher, laying his hand on his friend's shoulder, and paying no heed to the dog, ham, and dustman chivalry, "'aren't you two living together?' "'Oh, dear not,' said Septimus, in alarm, and then, catching at the first explanation, "'You see, our hours are different.' Cypher shook his head uncomprehendingly. The proprietor of the establishment, in dingy shirt-sleeves, set down the beer before him. Higasipi, who had mixed his absinthe and was waiting politely until their new friend should be served, raised his glass. "'Just before you came, monsieur,' said he, "'I was about to drink to the health.' Oh, "'Of l'armée française,' interrupted Septimus, reaching out his glass. "'But no, laughed Higasipi. "'It was to monsieur, madame, et bébé.' Bebe, cried Cypher, and Septimus felt his clear, swift glance read his soul. They clinked glasses. Egisipe, Egisipe, defying the laws governing the absorption of alcohols, tossed off his absinthe in swashbuckler fashion, and rose. Now I leave you. You have many things to talk about. My respectful compliments to madame. Monsieur, au revoir. He shook hands, saluted, and swaggered off, his chichia at the very back of his head, leaving half his shaven crown uncovered in front. "'A fine fellow, your friend, an intelligent fellow,' said Cypher, watching him. "'He's going to be a waiter,' said Septimus. "'Now that he's had his heels rubbed with the cure, he may be more ambitious. A valuable fellow for having given me a stupendous idea. But a bit indiscreet, eh? Never mind,' he added, seeing the piteous look on Septimus's face. "'I'll have discretion for the two of you. I'll not breathe a word of it to anybody.' "'Thank you,' said Septimus. There was an awkward silence. Septimus traced a diagram on the table with the spilled tea. Cypher lighted a cigar, which he smoked in the corner of his mouth, American fashion. "'Well, I'm damned,' he muttered below his breath. He looked hard at Septimus, intent on his tea-drawing. Then he shifted his cigar impatiently to the other side of his mouth. "'No, I'm damned if I am. I can't be.' "'You can't be what?' asked Septimus, catching his last words. "'Damned!' "'Why should you be?' "'Look here,' said Cypher. "'I've rushed in rather unceremoniously into your private affairs. I'm, I'm sorry. But I couldn't help taking an interest in the two of you, both for your own sake and that of Zora Middlemist.' "'I suppose you would do anything for her?' "'Yes.' "'So would I,' said Septimus, in a low voice. There are some women one lives for, and others one dies for. She is one of the women for whom one would live. Septimus shook his head. No, she's the other kind. It's much higher. I've had a lot of time to think the last few months, he continued after a pause. I've had no one but Emmy and Egisipi Crusoe to talk to, and I've thought a great deal about women. They used to come my way, and I didn't know anything at all about them. Do you now? asked Cypher with a smile. "'Oh, a great deal,' replied Septimus seriously. "'It's astonishing what a lot of difference there is between them and between the ways men approach different types. One woman a man wants to take by the hand and lead, and another he's quite content if she makes a carpet of his body and walks over it to save her feet from sharp stones. It's odd, isn't it?' "'Not very,' said Cypher, who took a more direct view of things than Septimus. It's merely because he has got a kindly feeling for one woman, and is desperately in love with the other. Perhaps that's it, said Septimus. Cypher again looked at him sharply, as a man does who thinks he has caught another man's sole secret. It was only under considerable stress of feeling that such coherence of ideas could have been expressed by his irrelevant friend. What he had learned the last few minutes had been a surprise, a pain, and a puzzle to him. The runaway marriage held more elements than he had imagined. He bent forward confidentially. "'You would make a carpet of your body for Zora Middlemist?' "'Why, of course,' replied the other, in perfect simplicity. "'Then, my friend, you're desperately in love with her.' There was kindness, help, sympathy in the big man's voice, and Septimus, though the challenge caused him agonies of shyness, did not find it in his heart to resent Cypher's logic. "'I suppose every man whom she befriends must feel the same towards her. "'Don't you?' "'I. I'm different. "'I've got a great work to carry through. "'I couldn't lie down for anybody to walk over me. "'My work would suffer. 
but in this mission of mine Zora Middlemist is intimately involved. I said it when I first saw her, and I said it just before she left for California. She is to stand by my side and help me. How, God knows. He laughed, seeing the bewildered face of Septimus, who had never heard of this transcendental connection of Zora with the spread of Cypher's cure. You seem to think I'm crazy. I'm not. I, I work everything on the most hard and fast common-sense lines. But when a voice inside you tells you a thing day and night, you must believe it. Said Septimus, If you'd not met her, you wouldn't have met Hegesibi Crusoe, and so you wouldn't have got the idea of army blisters. Cypher clapped him on the shoulder and extolled him as the miracle of lucidity. He exclaimed magniloquently, It was Zora's unseen influence working magnetically from the other side of the world that had led his footsteps towards the Hotel Godet on that particular afternoon. She had triumphantly vindicated her assertion that geographical location of her bodily presence could make no difference. "'I asked her to stay in England, you know,' he remarked more simply, seeing that Septimus lagged behind him in his flight. "'What for?' "'Why, to help me. For what other reason?' Septimus took off his hat and laid it on the chair vacated by Higgisippi, and ran his fingers reflectively up his hair. Cypher lit another cigar. Their side of the little street was deep in shade, but on half the road, and on the other side of the way, the fierce afternoon sunlight blazed. The merchant of wine, who had been lounging in his dingy shirt-sleeves against the doorpost, removed the glasses and wiped the table clear of the spilled tea. Cypher ordered two more box for the good of the house, while Septimus, still lost in thought, brought his hair to its highest pitch of straw or peterdom. Passers-by turned round to look at them, for well-dressed Englishmen do not often sit outside a marchand des vins, especially one with such hair. But passers-by are polite in France, and do not salute the unfamiliar with ribaldry. Well, said Cypher at last. We've been speaking intimately, said Septimus. He paused, then proceeded with his usual diffidence. I've never spoken intimately to a man before, and I don't quite know how to do it. It must be just like asking a woman to marry you. But don't you think you were selfish? Selfish? How? In asking Zora Middlemist to give up her trip to California just for the sake of the cure. It's worth the sacrifice, Cypher maintained. To you, yes, but it mayn't be so to her. But she believes in the thing as I do myself, cried Cypher. Why should she, any more than I or Hegisipi Crucio? If she did, she would have stayed. It would have been her duty. You couldn't expect a woman like Zora Middlemist to fail in her duty, could you? Cypher rubbed his eyes as if he saw things mistily. But they were quite clear. It was really Septimus Dix who sat opposite, concentrating his discursive mind on Cypher's cure and implicitly denying Zora's faith. A simple-minded man, in many respects, he would not have scorned to learn wisdom out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. But out of the mouth of Septimus what wisdom could possibly proceed? He laughed his suggestion away somewhat blusteringly, and launched out again on his panegyric of the cure. But his faith felt a quiver all through its structure, just as a great building does at the first faint shock of earthquake. "'What made you say that about Zora Middlemist?' he asked when he had finished. "'I don't know,' replied Septimus. "'It seems to be right to say it. "'I know when I get things into my head "'there appears to be room for nothing else in the world. "'One takes things for granted. "'When I was a child my father took it for granted "'that I believed in predestination. "'I couldn't, but I did not dare tell him so. "'So I went about with a load of somebody else's faith on my shoulders. "'It became intolerable, and when my father found out he beat me.' He had a bit of rope tied up with twine at the end for the purpose. I shouldn't like this to happen to Zora. This ended the discussion. The landlord at his jaw-post drew them into talk about the heat, the emptiness of Paris, and the happy lot of those who could go into Villegatura in the country. The arrival of a perspiring cabman in a red waistcoat and glazed hat caused him to retire within and administer to the newcomer's needs. One of my reasons for looking you up, said Cypher, was to make my apologies. Apologies? 
"'Yes, haven't you thought about the book on guns "'and wondered at not hearing from me?' "'No,' said Septimus. "'When I've invented a thing, the interest has gone. "'I've just invented a new sighting apparatus. "'I'll show you the model if you'll come to the hotel.' Cypher looked at his watch and excused himself on the ground of business engagements. Then he had to dine and start by the nine o'clock train. "'Anyhow,' said he, "'I'm ashamed that not having done anything with the guns. I did show the proofs to a naval expert, but he made all sorts of criticisms which didn't help. Experts know everything that is known and don't want to know anything that isn't.' So I laid it aside." "'Doesn't matter in the least,' said Septimus eagerly. "'And if you want to break the contract you sent me, "'I can pay you back the two hundred pounds.' "'But Cypher assured him that he had never broken a contract in his life, "'and they shook hands and went their respective ways, "'Septimus to the appartement in the boulevard de Raspey, "'and Cypher thoughtfully in the direction of the Luxembourg. "'He was sorry, very sorry, for Septimus Dix. "'His kindness of heart had not allowed him to tell the brutal truth about the guns.' The naval expert had scoffed in the free manner of those who follow the sea, and declared the great guns a mad inventor's dream. The Admiralty was overwhelmed with such things. The proofs were so much waste paper. Cypher had come prepared to break the news as gently as he could, but after all their talk it was not in his heart to, to do so. And the two hundred pounds? He regarded it as money given to a child to play with. He would never claim it. He was sorry, very sorry, for Septimus. He looked back along the past year and saw the man's dog-like devotion to Zora Middlemist. But why did he marry Emmy, loving the sister as he did? Why live apart from her, having married her? And the child? It was all a mystery in which he did not see clear. He pitied the ineffectuality of Septimus with the kind yet half-contemptuous pity of the strong man with a fine nature. But as for his denial of Zora's faith, he laughed it away. Egotistical, yes. Zora had posed the same question as Septimus, and he had answered it. But her faith in the cure itself, his mission to spread it far and wide over the earth, and to save the nations from vulgar competitors who thought of nothing but sordid gain, that, he felt sure, remained unshaken. Yet as he walked along in the alien though familiar city, he was smitten, as with physical pain, by a craving for her presence, for the gleam of her eyes, for the greatness of sympathy and comprehension that inhabited her generous and beautiful frame. The need of her was imperious. He stopped at a café on the boulevard Saint-Michel, called for the wherewithal to write, and, like a poet in the fine frenzy of inspiration, poured out his soul to her over the heels of the armies of the world. He walked a great deal during the day, when he stepped out of the cab that evening at the Gare de Lyon, he felt an unfamiliar stinging in his heel. During the process of looking after his luggage and seeking his train, he limped about the platform. When he undressed for the night in his sleeping compartment, he found that a ruck in his sock had caused a large blister. He regarded it with superstitious eyes and thought of the armies of the world. In hoc signo vinces, the message had come from heaven. He took a sample box of Cypher's cure from his handbag, and, almost with reverence, anointed his heel. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 14 Clem Cypher slept the sleep of the warrior preparing for battle. When he awoke at Lyon, he had all the sensations of a wounded Achilles. His heels smarted and tingled and ached, and every time he turned over, determined on a continuation of slumber, his foot seemed to occupy the whole width of the berth. He reanointed himself and settled down again. But wakefulness had gripped him. He pulled up the blinds of the compartment and let the dawn stream in, and, lying on his back, gave himself up to the plans of his new campaign. The more he thought out the scheme, the simpler it became. He had made it his business to know personages of high influence in every capital in Europe. Much of his success had already been gained that way. The methods of introduction had concerned him but little. For social purposes they could have been employed only by a pushing upstart. But in the furtherance of a divine mission, 
the apostle does not bind his inspired feet with the shackles of ordinary convention. Cypher rushed in, therefore, where the pachyderms of Park Lane would have feared to, to tread. Just as the fanatical evangelist has no compunction in putting to an entire stranger embarrassing questions as to his possession of the peace of God, so had Cypher no scruple in approaching any foreigner of distinguished mien in an hotel lounge, and converting him to the religion of Cypher's cure. In most cosmopolitan resorts his burly figure and pink face were well known. Newspapers paragraphed his arrival and departure. People pointed him out to one another in promenades. Distinguished personages to whom he had casually introduced himself introduced him to other distinguished personages. When he threw off the apostle and became the man, his simple directness and charm of manner caused him to be accepted pleasurably for his own sake. Had he chosen to take advantage of his opportunities, he might have consorted with very grand folks indeed, a price, be it said, which his pride refused to pay. But he had no social ambitions. The grand folks therefore respected him and held out a cordial hand as he passed by. That very train was carrying to Switzerland a Russian grand duke, who greeted him with a large smile and a Ah, ce bon siffère, on the platform of the Gare de Lyon, and had presented him as the friend of humanity to the Grand Duchess. To Cypher, lying on his back and dreaming of the days when through him the forced marches of weary troops would become light-hearted strolls along the road, the jealously guarded portals of the war offices of the world presented no terrors. He ticked off the countries in his mind until he came to Turkey. Whom did he know in Turkey? He had once given a certain Musiorus Bey a light for his cigarette in the atrium of the casino at Monte Carlo, but that could scarcely be called an introduction. No matter, his star was now in the ascendant. The Lord would surely provide a Turk for him in Geneva. He shifted his position in the berth, and a twinge of pain passed through his foot, hurting horribly. When he rose to dress, he found some difficulty in putting on his boot. On leaving the train up at Geneva, he could scarcely walk. In his room at the hotel, he anointed his heel again with the cure, and, glad to rest, sat by the window looking at the blue lake and Mont Blanc, white-capped in the quivering distance, his leg supported on a chair. Then his traveller, who had arranged to meet him by appointment, was shown into the room. They were to lunch together. To ease his foot, Cypher put on an evening slipper and hobbled downstairs. The traveller told a depressing tale. Jebusa Jones had got in everywhere and was underselling the cure. A new German skin remedy had insidiously crept onto the market. Wholesale houses wanted impossible discounts, and retail chemists could not be inveigled into placing any but the most insignificant orders. He gave dismaying details, terribly anxious all the while, lest his chief should attribute to his incompetence the growing unpopularity of the cure. But to his amazement, Cypher listened smilingly to his story of disaster, and ordered a bottle of champagne. "'All that is nothing,' he cried. "'A flea-bite in the ocean. "'It will right itself as the public realise how they are being taken in by these American and German impostors. "'The cure can't fail. "'And let me tell you, Denny Mead, my son, the cure is going to flourish as it has never flourished before. "'I've got a scheme that will take your breath away.' The glow of inspiration in Cypher's blue eyes and the triumph written on his resolute face brought the features of the worried traveller for the first time into an expression of normal satisfaction with the world. "'I will stagger you to your commercial depths, my boy,' Cypher continued. "'Have a drink first, before I tell you.' He raised his champagne glass. "'To Cypher's cure!' They drank the toast solemnly. And then Cypher unfolded to his awe-stricken subordinate the scheme for de-blistering the heels of the armies of the world. Denimede, fired by his enthusiasm, again lifted his brimming glass. "'By God, sir, you are a conqueror, an Alexander, a Hannibal, a Napoleon. There's a colossal fortune in it.' "'And it will give me enough money,' said Cypher, "'to advertise Jabusa Jones and the others off the face of the earth.' "'You needn't worry about them, sir, when you've got the army contracts,' said the traveller. He could not follow the spirituality underlying his chief's remark. Cypher laid down the peach he was peeling, and looked pityingly at Denimede as one of little faith, one born to the day of small things. 
"'It will be all the more my duty to do so,' said he, "'when all the instruments are placed in my hands. "'What, after all, is the healing of a few blistered feet, "'compared with the scourge of leprosy, eczema, itch, psoriasis, and what not? "'And as for the money itself, what is it?' "'He preached his sermon. "'The securing of the world's army contracts "'was only a means towards the shimmering ideal. "'It would clear the path of obstacles "'and leave the cure free to pursue its universal way "'as consolatrix afflictorum.' The traveller finished his peach, and accepted another, which his host hospitably selected for him. "'All the same, sir,' said he, "'this is the biggest thing you've struck. May I ask how you came to strike it?' "'Like all great schemes, it had humble beginnings,' said Cypher, in comfortable postprandial mood, unconsciously flattered by the admiration of his subordinate. "'Newton saw an apple drop to the ground, hence the theory of gravitation.' The glory of Tyre and Sidon arose from the purple droppings of a little dog's mouth who had been eating shellfish. The great Cunardas came out of the lid of Stevenson's family kettle. A soldier happened to tell me that his mother had applied Cypher's cure to his blistered heels, and that was the origin of the scheme. He leaned back in his chair, stretched out his legs, and put one foot over the other. He immediately started back with a cry of pain. "'I was forgetting my own infernal blister,' said he. "'About a square inch of skin is off, and all the flesh round it is as red as a tomato.' "'You'll have to be careful,' advised the traveller. "'What are you using for it?' "'Using for it? Why, good heavens, man, the cure! What else?' He regarded Denimede as if he were insane, and Denimede, in his confusion, blushed as red as the blistered heel. They spent the afternoon over the reports and figures which had so greatly depressed the traveller. He left his chief with hopes throbbing in his breast. He had been promised a high position in the new army contract department. As soon as he had gone, Cypher rubbed in more of the cure. He passed a restless night. In the morning he found the ankle considerably swollen. He could scarcely put the foot to the ground. He got into bed again and rang the bell for the valet de chambre. The valet entered. Cypher explained. He had a bad foot and wanted to see a doctor. Did the valet know of a good doctor? The valet not only knew of a good doctor, but an English doctor resident in Geneva who was always summoned to attend English and American visitors at the hotel. Furthermore, he was in the hotel at that very moment. "'Ask him if he would kindly step up,' said Cypher. He looked ruefully at his ankle, which was about the size of his calf wondering why the cure had not affected its advertised magic. The inflammation, however, clearly required medical advice. In the midst of his ruefulness, the doctor, a capable-looking man of five-and-thirty, entered the room. He examined the heel and ankle with professional scrutiny. Then he raised his head. "'Have you been treating it in any way?' "'Yes,' said Cypher, "'with the cure.' "'What cure?' "'Why, Cypher's cure.' The doctor brought his hand down on the edge of the footboard of the bed with a gesture of impatience. "'Why on earth do people treat themselves with quack remedies they know nothing about?' "'Quack remedies?' cried Cypher. "'Of course, they're all pestilential, and if I had my way I'd have them stacked in the marketplace and burned by the common hangman. But the most pestilential of the lot is Cypher's cure. He ought never to have used it.' Cypher had the sensation of the hotel walls crashing down upon his head, falling across his throat and weighing upon his chest. For a few instants he suffered a nightmare paralysis. Then he gasped for breath. At last he said very quietly, "'Do you know who I am?' "'I have not had the pleasure,' said the doctor. "'They only gave me your room number.' "'I am Clem Cipher, the proprietor of Cipher's Cure.' The two men stared at one another. Cypher in a blue-striped pyjama jacket, supporting himself by one elbow on the bed. The doctor at the foot. The doctor spread out his hands. "'It's the most horrible moment of my life. I am at your mercy. I only gave you my honest opinion, the result of my experience. If I had known your name, naturally—' "'You had better go,' said Cypher, in a queer voice, digging the nails into the palms of his hands. "'Your fee? And there's no question of it. I'm only grieved to the heart at having wounded you. Good morning.' The door closed behind him, and Cypher gave himself up to his furious indignation. This soothed the soul, but further inflamed the ankle. He called up the manager of the hotel, and sent for the leading medical man in Geneva. 
When he arrived, he took care to acquaint him with his name and quality. Dr. Bourdieu, professor of dermatology to the University of Geneva, made his examination and shook a tactful head. With all consideration for the many admirable virtues of la Cure yet there were certain maladies of the skin for which he personally would not prescribe it. For this, for that, he rattled off half a dozen of learned diseases, it might very well be efficacious. Its effect would probably be benign in a case of elementiasis. But in a case of abrasion of the cuticle, where there was a large surface of raw flesh laid bare, perhaps a simpler treatment might be more desirable. His tone was exquisite, and he chose his language so that not a word could wound. Cypher listened to him with a sinking heart. "'In your opinion, then, doctor,' said he, "'it isn't a good thing for blistered heels.' "'You ask for my opinion,' replied the Professor of Dermatology at the University of Geneva. "'I give it to you. No.' Cypher threw out a hand desperately argumentative. "'But I know of a case in which it has proved efficacious. A zouave of my acquaintance—' Dr. Boulier smiled. "'A zouave. Just as nothing is sacred to a sapper, so is nothing hurtful to a zouave. They have hides like hippopotamuses, those fellows. You could dip them in vitriol, and they wouldn't feel it.' "'So his heels recovered in spite of the cure,' said Cyphus grimly. "'Evidently,' said Dr. Bourdieu. Cypher sat in his room for a couple of days, his leg on a chair, and looked at Mont Blanc, exquisite in its fairy splendour against the far, pale sky. It brought him no consolation. On the contrary, it reminded him of Hannibal and other conquerors leading their foot-sore armies over the Alps. When he allowed a despondent fancy to wander uncontrolled, he saw great multitudes of men staggering shoeless, along with feet and ankles inflamed to the colour of tomatoes. Then he pulled himself together and set his teeth. Denimy came to visit him and heard with dismay the verdict of Sant, which crushed his hope of a high position in the new army contract department. But Cypher reassured him as to his material welfare by increasing his commission on foreign sales whereupon he began to take a practical view of the situation. "'We can't expect a patent medicine, sir, to do everything.' "'I quite agree with you,' said Cypher. "'It can't make two legs grow where one grew before, but it ought to cure blisters on the heel. Apparently it won't. So we are where we were before I met Monsieur Egisipe Cruchot. The only thing is that we mustn't now lead people to suppose that it's good for blisters.' "'They must take their chance,' said Denimid. He was a sharp, black-haired young man, with a worried brow and a bilious complexion. The soothing of the human race with Cypher's balm of Gilead mattered nothing to him. His attributed temperament rendered his attitude towards humanity rather misanthropic than otherwise. "'Indeed,' he continued, "'I don't see why you shouldn't drive for the army contracts without referring specifically to sore feet.' "'Caveat emptor,' said Cypher. "'I, I beg your pardon?' said Denimede, who had no latinity. "'It means, let the buyer beware. It's up to the buyer to see what stuff he's buying.' And "'Naturally, it's the first principle of business.' Cypher turned his swift, clear glance on him, and banged the window-ledge with his hand. "'It's the first principle of damned knavery and thieving,' he cried. "'And if I thought anyone ran my business on it, they'd go out of my employ at once. It's at the root of all the corruption that exists in modern trade.' It salves the conscience of the psalm-singing grocer who puts ground beans into his coffee. It's a damnable principle. He thumped the window ledge again, very angry. The traveller hedged. Uh, of course, it's immoral to tell lies and say a thing is what it isn't. But on the other hand, no one could run a patent medicine on the lines of warning the public as to what it isn't good for. You say on the wrapper it will cure gout and rheumatism. If a woman buys a bottle and gives it to her child who's got scarlet fever, and the child dies from it, it's her lookout and not yours. When a firm does issue a warning such as, won't wash clothes, it's a business proceeding for the firm's own protection. Well, well, it's your warning. Won't cure blisters, said Cypher. I advertise myself as the friend of humanity. I am, according to my lights. If I let poor fellows on the march reduce their feet to this condition— I should be the scourge of mankind, like—' He snapped his fingers, trying to recall the name. "'Like Atlas. No, it wasn't Atlas, but no matter. 
Not a box of the cure has been sold without the guarantee stamp of my soul's conviction on it. The Jebusa Jones people aren't so conscientious, said Denny Mead. I bought a part of their stuff this morning. They've got a new wrapper. See? He unfolded a piece of paper and pointed out the place to his chief. They have a special paragraph in large print. Gives instant relief to blistered feet. Every mountaineer should carry it in his grip sack. They're the enemies of God and man, said Cypher and sooner than copy their methods I would close down the factory and never sell another box as long as I lived. "'It's a thousand pities, sir, anyhow,' said Denny Mead, trying to work back diplomatically, "'that the army contract scheme has to be thrown overboard.' "'Yes, it's a nuisance,' said Cypher. When he dismissed the traveller he laughed grimly. "'A nuisance!' The word was a grotesque anticlimax. He sat for a long while with his hands blinding his eyes, trying to realise what the abandonment of the scheme meant to him. He was a man who faced his responsibilities squarely. For the first time in his life he had tried the cure seriously on himself, chance never having given him cause before, and it had failed. He had heard the cure which he regarded as a divine unction termed a pestilential quackery. The words burned red-hot in his brain. He had heard it depreciated with charming tact and courtesy, by a great authority on diseases of the skin. One short word, no, had wiped out of existence his Napoleonic scheme for the armies of the world, for putting them on a sound footing. He smiled bitterly, the incongruous jest passed through his mind. He'd been fighting for months, and losing ground, but this was the first absolute check that his faith had received. He staggered under it half-wonderingly, like a man who has been hit by an unseen hand and looked around to see whence the blow came. Why should it come now? He looked back along the years. Not a breath of disparagement had touched the cure's fair repute. His files in London were full of testimonials honourably acquired. Some of these from lowly folk were touching in their simple gratitude. It is true that his manager suggested the authors had sent them in the hope of gain and of seeing their photographs in the halfpenny newspapers. But his manager, Shuttleworth, was a notorious and dismal cynic who believed in nothing save the commercial value of the cure. Letters had come in with coronative flaps to the envelopes. The writers certainly hoped neither for gain nor for odd notoriety. He had never paid a fee for a testimonial throughout his career. Every one that he printed was genuine and unsolicited. He had been hailed as the friend of humanity by all sorts and conditions of men. Why, suddenly, should he be branded as a dealer in pestilence? His thought wandered back to the beginning of things. He saw himself in the chemist's shop in Bury St. Edmunds, a little shop in a little town, too small, he felt, for the great unknown something within him that was craving for expansion the dull making up of subscriptions, the selling of tooth powder and babies' feeding bottles, the deadly mechanical routine. He remembered the daily revolt against it all. He remembered his discovery of the old herbalists, his delight in their quaint language, the remedies so extraordinary and yet so simple. His first idea of combining these with the orthodox drugs of the British pharmacopoeia, his experiments, his talks with an aged man who kept a dingy little shop of herbs on the outskirt of the town, also called a pestilential fellow by the medical faculty of the district, but a learned ancient all the same, who knew the qualities of every herb that grew, and, with some reeking mess of pulp, was said to have cured an old woman's malignant ulcer, given up as incurable by the faculty. He remembered the night when the old man, grateful for the lad's interests in his learning, gave him, under vows of secrecy, the recipe of this healing emulsion, which was to become the basis of Cypher's cure. In those days his loneliness was cheered by a bulldog, an ugly, faithful beast whom he called Barabbas. He sighed to think how many Barabbases had lived and died since then, and who, contracting mange, became the corpus vile of many experiments, first with the old man's emulsion, then with the emulsion mixed with other drugs, all bound together in pure animal fat until at last he found a mixture which to his joy made the sores heal and the skin harden and the hair sprout, and Barabbas grow sleek as a swell mobsman in affluent circumstances. Then, one day, came his grace of Suffolk into the shop 
with a story of a pet of the Duchess's stricken with the same disease. Cypher modestly narrated his own experience, and gave the mighty man a box of the new ointment. A fortnight afterwards he returned. Not only had it cured the dog, but it must have charmed away the eczema on his ducal hands. Full of a wild surmise, he tried it next on his landlady's child, who had a sore on its legs, and lo, the sore healed. It was then that the divine revelation came to him. It was then that he passed his vigil, as he had told Zora, and consecrated himself and his cure to the service of humanity. The steps, the struggles, the purchase of the chemist's business, the early exploitation of the cure, its gradual renown in the district, the first whisperings of its fame abroad, thanks to his grace of Suffolk, the early advertising, the gradual growth, the sale of the chemist's business, the establishment of Cypher's cure as a special business in the town, the transference to London, the burst into world-wide fame. All the memories came back to him as he sat by the window of the Hotel de l'Europe and blinded his face with his hands. He dashed them away at last with a passionate gesture. "'It can't be! It can't be!' he cried aloud, as many another man has cried in the righteous rebellion of his heart against the ironical decrees of the high gods, whom his simple nature has never suspected of their eternal and inscrutable irony. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Septimus by William John Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 15. If you travel on the high road which skirts the cliff-bound coast of Normandy, you may come to a board bearing the legend Otito sur mer, and a hand pointing down a narrow gorge. If you follow the direction and descend for half a mile, you come to a couple of villas, a humble café, some fishermen's cottages, one of which is also a general shop and a débit de tabac, a view of a triangle of sea, and eventually to a patch of shingly beach between two great bastions of cliffs. The beach itself contains a diminutive jetty, a tiny fleet of fishing smacks, some nets, three bathing machines joined together by ropes, on which hang a few towels and bathing costumes, a dog, a child or so with spade and bucket, two English maiden ladies writing picture postcards, a Frenchman in black, reading a Rouen newspaper under a grey umbrella, his wife and a daughter, and a stall of mussels presided over by an old woman with skin like seaweed. Just above the beach, on one side of the road leading up the gorge, is a miniature barn with a red cupola, which is the casino, and on the other a long, narrow, blue-washed building with the words written in great black letters across the façade, Hôtel de la Plage. As soon as Emmy could travel, she implored Septimus to find her a quiet spot by the sea whither the fashionable do not resort. Septimus naturally consulted Igisipi Crucio. Igisipi asked for time to consult his comrades. He returned with news of an ideal spot. It was a village in the Pyrenees, about six thousand feet up in the air and forty miles from a railway station. They could shoot bears all day long. When Emmy explained that a village on the top of the Pyrenees was not by the seaside, and that neither she nor his aunt, Madame Bolivard, took any interest in the destruction of bears, he retired somewhat crestfallen, and went with his difficulties to Angélique, the young lady in the wine-shop in the Rue des Francs-Bouchères. Angélique informed him that a brave sailor on leave from his torpedo-boat was in the habit of visiting the wine-shop every evening. He ought to know something of the sea. A meeting was arranged by Angélique between Egisipe, Septimus, and the brave sailor, much to Emmy's sceptical amusement. And the brave sailor, after absorbing prodigious quantities of alcohol, and reviewing all the places on the earth's coastline from Yokohama to Paris Plage, declared that the veritable Eden by the sea was none other than his native village of Otto sur mer He made a plan of it on the table, two square packets of tobacco representing the cliffs, a pipe stem the road leading up the gorge, some tobacco dust to the beach, and some coffee slops applied with the finger the English Channel. Septimus came back to Emmy. I have found the place. It is Otto Somir. It has one hotel. You can catch shrimps, and its mussels are famous all over the world. After consultation of a guide to Normandy, on which Emmy's prudence insisted, they found the brave sailor's facts mainly correct, and decided on Otto Somir. I will take you there 
see that you are comfortably settled, and then come back to, to Paris, said Septimus. You'll be quite happy with Madame Bolivard, won't you? Of course, said Emmy, looking away from him. What are you going to do in Paris all by yourself? Guns, he replied. Then he added reflectively, I also don't see how I can get out of the Hotel Godet. I've been there some time, and I don't know how much to give the servants in tips. The only thing is to stay on. Emmy sighed, just a bit wistfully, and made no attempt to prove the futility of his last argument. The wonderfully sweet of life had come to her of late, mingled with the unutterably bitter. She was in the state of being when a woman accepts without question. Septimus then went to the St. Lazare station to make arrangements, and discovered an official who knew a surprising amount about railway travelling and the means of bringing a family from domicile to station. He entered Septimus's requirements in a book, and assured him that at the appointed hour an omnibus would be waiting outside the house in the boulevard Raspey. Septimus thought him a person of marvellous intellect, and gave him five francs. So the quaint quartet started in comfort, Septimus and Emmy and Madame Bolivard, and the little lump of mortality which the Frenchwoman carried in her great motherly arms. Madame Bolivard, who had not been out of Paris for twenty years, needed all her maternal instincts to subdue her excitement at the prospect of seeing the open country and the sea. In the railway carriage she pointed out cattle to the unconscious infant, with the tremulous quiver of the traveller who espies a herd of hippogriffin. "'Is it corn, that, monsieur? Mon Dieu, it is beautiful! Regard, then, the corn, my cherished one!' But the cherished one cared not for corn or cattle. He preferred to fix his cold eyes on Septimus, as if wondering what he was doing in that galley. Now and again Septimus would bend forward, and, with a vague notion of the way to convey one's polite intentions to babies, would prod him gingerly in the cheek, and utter an insane noise, and then surreptitiously wipe his finger on his trousers. When his mother took him, she had little spasms of tenderness, during which she pressed him tightly to her bosom, and looked frightened. The child was precious to her. She had paid a higher price than most women, and that, perhaps, enhanced its value. At Fécomp, a rusty, ramshackle diligence awaited them. Their luggage, together with hencoops, baskets, bundles, packing-cases, were piled on top in an amorphous heap. They took their places inside, together with an old priest and a present woman in a great flapping cap. The old priest absorbed snuff in great quantities and used a red handkerchief. The closed windows of the vehicle rattled, it was very hot, and the antiquated cushions smelled abominably. Emmy, tired of the railway journey and suffocated by the heat, felt inclined to cry. This was her first step into her newly conditioned world, and her heart sank. She regretted her comfortable rooms in Paris, and the conditions of existence there of which Septimus was an integral part. She had got used to them, to his forced association with the intimate details of her life, to his bending over the child like a grotesque fairy godfather, and making astonishing suggestions for its upbringing. She had regarded him less as a stranger to be treated with feminine reserve than the doctor. Now it was different. She was about to take up her own life again, with new responsibilities, and the dearly loved creature whom she had bullied and laughed at and leaned on would go away to take up his own queer way of life, and the relations between them could not possibly be the same again. The diligence was taking her on the last stage of her journey towards the new conditions, and it jolted and bumped and smelled and took an interminable time. "'I'm sure,' said she woefully, "'there's no such place as Hotetot-sur-Mer, and we're going on for ever to find it.' Presently Septimus pointed triumphantly through the window. "'There it is.' "'Where?' cried Emmy, for not a house was in sight. Then she saw the board. The old diligence turned and creaked and swung and pitched down the gorge. When they descended to the Hôtel de la Plage, the setting sun blazed on their faces across the sea, and shed its golden enchantment over the little pebbly beach. At that hour the only living thing on it was the dog, and he was asleep. It was a spot certainly to which the fashionable did not resort. "'It will be good for Baby, and for you,' she shrugged her shoulders. "'What is good for one is not always—' She paused, feeling ungrateful, then she added— it's the best place you could have brought us to. 
After dinner they sat on the beach and leaned against a fishing boat. It was full moon. The northern cliff cast its huge shadow out to sea and halfway across the beach. A knot of fisher-folk sat full in the moonlight on the jetty and sang a song with a mournful refrain. Behind them, in the square of yellow light of the salon window, could be seen the figures of the two English maiden ladies, apparently still addressing picture postcards. The luminous picture stood out sharp against the dark mass of the hotel. Beyond the shadow of the cliff, the sea lay like a silver mirror in the windless air. A tiny border of surf broke on the pebbles. Emmy drew a long breath and asked Septimus if he smelled the seaweed. The dog came and sniffed at their boots. Then, from the excellent leather, judging them to be persons above his social station, he turned humbly away. Septimus called him, made friends with him. He was a smooth, yellow dog of no account. And eventually he curled up between them and went to sleep. Septimus smoked his pipe. Emmy played with the ear of the dog and looked out to sea. It was very peaceful, and after a while she sighed. "'I suppose this must be our last evening together.' "'I suppose it must,' said Septimus. "'Are you quite sure you can afford all the money you're leaving with me?' "'Of course it comes out of the bank.' "'I know that, you stupid,' she laughed. "'Where else could it come from unless you kept it in a stocking?' "'But the bank isn't an unlimited gold-mine from which you can draw out as many handfuls as you want.' Septimus knocked the ashes out of his pipe. "'People don't get sovereigns out of gold-mines. I, I wish they did. "'They extract a bit of gold about the size of this pebble out of a ton of quartz. "'I once bought shares in a gold-mine, and there wasn't any gold in it at all. "'I always used to be buying things like that. People sell them to me. "'I was like Moses.' "'Moses?' "'Oh, not that Moses. He could get anything out of anything. He got water out of a rock. I mean, the son of the vicar of Wakefield, who bought the green spectacles.' "'Oh,' said Emmy, who, after the way of her generation, had never heard of him. "'I don't do it, let people sell me things, any more now,' he said gravely. "'I seem to have got wise. Perhaps it has come through having had to look after you. I see things much clearer.' He filled and lit another pipe, and began to talk about Orion just visible over the shoulder of the cliff. Emmy, whose interests were for the moment terrestrial, interrupted him. "'There's one thing I want you to see clearly, my dear, and that is that I owe you a frightful lot of money. But I'm sure to get something to do when I'm back in London, and then I can repay you by instalments. Remember, I'm not going to rest until I pay you back.' I, "'I shan't rest if you do,' said Septimus nervously. "'Please don't talk of it. It, it hurts me.' I've done little enough in the world, God knows. Give me this chance of, the Buddhists call it, acquiring merit. This was not a new argument between them. Emmy had a small income under her father's will, and the prospect of earning a modest salary on the stage. She reckoned that she would have sufficient to provide for herself and the child. Hitherto Septimus had been her banker. Neither of them had any notion of the value of money, and Septimus had a child's faith in the magic of the drawn cheque. He would as soon have thought of measuring the portion of whisky he poured out for a guest as of counting the money he advanced to Emmy. She took up his last words, and, speaking in a low tone, as a woman does when her pride has gone from her, she said, "'Haven't you acquired enough merit already, my dear? Don't you see the impossibility of my going on accepting things from you? You seem to take it for granted that you're to provide for me and the child for the rest of our lives.' I've been a bad, unprincipled fool of a girl, I know. Yes, rotten, bad. There are thousands like me in London. Septimus rose to his feet. Oh, don't, Emmy, don't. I can't stand it. She rose too, and put her hands on his shoulders. You must let me speak to-night, our last night before we part. It isn't generous of you not to listen. The yellow dog, disturbed in his slumbers, shook himself, and regarding them with an air of humble sympathy, turned and walked away discreetly into the shadow. The fisher-folk on the jetty still sang their mournful chorus. "'Sit down again?' Septimus yielded. "'But why give yourself pain?' he asked gently. "'To ease my heart. The knife does good. Yes, I know I've been worthless. But I'm not as bad as that. Don't you see how horrible the idea is to me? I must pay you back the money, and, of course, not come on you for any more.' You've done too much for me already. It somehow stuns me to think of it. 
It was only because I was in hell and mad and grasp at the hand you held out to me. I suppose I've done you the biggest wrong a woman can do a man. Now I've come to my senses, I shudder at what I've done. Why, why, said Septimus, growing miserably unhappy. How can you ever marry unless we go through the vulgarity of a collusive divorce? My dear girl, said he, what woman ever married a preposterous lunatic like me? There's not a woman living who ought not to have gone down on her bended knees if she had married you. I should never have married, said he, laying his hand for a moment reassuringly on hers. Who knows? She gave a slight laugh. Zora is only a woman like the rest of us. Why talk of Zora? he said quickly. What has she to do with it? Everything. You don't suppose I don't know, she replied in a low voice. It was for her sake and not for mine. He was about to speak when she put out her hand and covered his mouth. Let me talk for a little. She took up her parable again and spoke very gently, very sensibly. The moonlight peacefulness was in her heart. It softened the tone of her voice and reflected itself in unfamiliar speech. I seem to have grown twenty years older, she said. She desired on that night to make her gratitude clear to him, to ask his pardon for past offences. She had been like a hunted animal. Sometimes she had licked his hand, and sometimes she had scratched it. She had not been quite responsible. Sometimes she had tried to send him away, for his own sake. For herself, she had been terrified at the thought of losing him. Another man might have done what you did out of chivalry, but no other man but you would not have despised the woman. I deserved it, but I knew you didn't despise me. You've been just the same to me all through, as you were in the early days. It braced me up and helped me to keep some sort of self-respect. That was the chief reason why I could not let you go. Now all is over. I'm quite sane and as happy as I shall ever be. After tonight it stands to reason we must each lead our separate lives. You can't do anything more for me. And God knows, my poor dear, I can't do anything for you. So I want to thank you. She put her arm around his shoulder and kissed his cheek. Septimus flushed. Her lips were soft and her breath was sweet. No woman save his mother had ever kissed him. He turned and took her hands. Let me accept that in full payment for everything. You, you want me to go away happy, don't you? My dear, she said with a little catch in her voice, if there was anything in the world I could do to make you happy, short of throwing baby to a tiger... I would do it. Septimus took off his cap and brought his hair to its normal perpendicularity. Dear me, what are you going to say? Septimus reflected for a moment. If I dine off a bloater in a soup plate in the drawing room, or if my bed isn't made at six o'clock in the evening and my, my house is a cross between a pigsty and an ironmonger's shop, nobody minds. It is only Septimus Dix's extraordinary habits. But if the woman who is my wife in the eyes of the world... "'Yes, yes, I see,' she said hurriedly. "'I hadn't looked at it in that light.' "'The boy is going to Cambridge,' he murmured. "'Then I should like him to go into Parliament. "'There are deuced clever fellows in Parliament. I, "'I met one in Venice two or three years ago. "'He knew an awful lot of things. "'We spent an evening together on the Grand Canal, "'and he talked all the time most interestingly "'on the drainage system of Barrow and Furness. "'I wonder how fellows get to know about drains.' "'Emmy said, would it make you happy? From her tone he gathered that she referred to the subject of contention between them, and not to his thirst for sanitary information. Of course it would. But how shall I ever repay you? Perhaps once a year, he said, you can settle up in full, as you did just now. There was a long silence, and then Emmy remarked that it was a heavenly night. End of chapter 15